Hi, welcome to Community Homeworks. My name is Jason and I am the Education Manager at Community Homeworks. I know most of you joined because you wanted to see Jean introduce this class, but Jean's on vacation this week, so you get to put up with me. Um, tonight's workshop, we're going to be talking about power tools, introducing you to power tools, some of the common power tools that are used for home repair and home maintenance projects. Um, we will offer the second part of Power Tools in two weeks on the 29th of June. Next week, we have a special workshop. Uh, we will have Julie here who will be talking about how to replace and repair window screens. Um, so make sure to tune in for that. That'll be next week at six o'clock. Like I said, the 29th at six, we will be doing the second half of this class. Tonight's class will focus primarily on um, safety and how to choose tools and what to look for in tools to make sure that they're going to do the job that you want them to do. Our instructor for tonight is um, the infamous Lee Taylor. Lee is a, um, he works for Habitat during the day and he comes here and helps teach classes for us um, in the evenings sometimes. So we're really glad Lee's here. Also, we're really thankful that Lee's wife, Lori, is here filming for us. So thank you both, Lee and Lori, and thanks for being here. All right. Thanks, Jason. Um, yeah, and thanks for watching. So what we're going to be talking about tonight, like Jason said, was the, uh, you know, is the, the safety aspect of power tools. And that always takes a minute to get through. Um, we're going to be talking about, you know, some of the most common tools uh, out there. I don't think Jason mentioned it. If you have a question, there should be an area underneath in the comments section where you can ask a question. Uh, so feel free to do that. And uh, if it's something I can answer, great. Uh, if it's not, it might be covered in another class. That is something about these classes. There's a lot of overlap in these classes. And uh, it's kind of by design. So we try to make it so that... Um, you, you start to see all the connections, you know, that uh, really are in anybody's home. So with that being said, he said, if you have questions, just ask. So the safety aspect of things. So he said, power tools are great. Uh, they will make your work a lot easier. Uh, they will make it so that you can do things a lot quicker, uh, more accurately, um, more efficiently. On that same note, they don't care if they cut off a finger or an arm or maim you in some way. Uh, any power tool can have the potential to be able to do that. Uh, I always say, you know, if you if you've worked with power tools for a while and you have all all your fingers still, it's a good thing. So um, you know, safety is one of those things that is it you have to really pay attention to. So on that note, I want to start with the good old safety glasses. So safety glasses, they said they come in all shapes and sizes. The, the thing to think about with the safety glass is, um, A, you wanna make sure that they're rated, I can't see. that they're rated for uh, impact. It's basically impact resistance as far as, you know, not chattering or not, you know, uh, cracking and stuff like that. Uh, safety glasses are gonna have a stamp on them it's uh, the stamp number is Z87. That is uh, saying that they've been qualified or certified, I'm sorry, for a safety glass. So that's first step. Second step is when you get your safety glasses, um, if, you, if you're not wearing glasses, and we'll get into that one in a minute. Let's say you're just wearing standard safety glasses. They need to be comfortable. And I say, I joke around that you need to find yourself in the middle of the grocery store and still realize you're wearing your safety glasses. Comfortable to that point. If they're not comfortable, people are going to do this and wear them on top of their head. It doesn't do any good. So, you know, sometimes, um, sometimes you can get lucky and find a relatively inexpensive pair. Sometimes you have to look a little bit harder and uh, find a pair that's actually going to work for your shape of your face and you know how you how you like to wear them 
Um, but comfort is really a big thing. If they're not comfortable, you're not going to wear them. If you don't wear them, you really risk a uh, good eye injury. Um, once you do find a pair that works for you, you know, sometimes, you know, like I said, it's sometimes you want to make sure you have uh, a clear pair. And sometimes you want to make sure you have a pair that's actually like for sunglasses or something along that line. It can be a little bit of annoying uh, switching them back and forth if you're switching from outside to inside. But it is one of those things. Um, as far as keeping them, uh, keeping them in good shape, uh, if you have an old case, if, you, if your pair of safety glasses will fit in like a hard case or something like that, and you want to keep them, say, in a toolbox, Great. Um, some people will put them in an old sock, you know, just keep them from getting scratched up. Because again, if they sit and they spin around like this and the lenses get all scratched up, uh, that actually your safety equipment can actually become a hindrance. So, you know, so once you find that pair that you really like, you make sure that you treat them nice. And so if you treat them nice, they're going to last you a decent amount of time. So, that's pretty much it as far as this style safety glass. The other style safety glass is the good old goggles. Now, the other thing is, is that sometimes you can find styles like this that will fit over your existing glasses. Great. Some people will opt for this. Um, again, these are going to be rated. You know, it's a, it's a plastic style. It's nice because you're not going to let, you know, stuff in. Uh, necessarily on the sides and that's the other thing with the safety glasses is a lot of it is how much they wrap around the side because you'll get you'll get uh, material that wants to come in at an angle this way um, so there is this style for if you're wearing glasses some people will uh, when they get glasses let's say you're doing you know you're always doing projects and stuff like that you can get safety rated glass uh, for your prescription lenses, and then they can provide uh, clips that clip on to the arms on the side just to protect you for that side uh, protection from stuff coming in from the side. So there's multiple ways to be able to do that, but safety glasses are a good thing. It really does hurt when something gets slammed in your eye. So take that uh, pretty seriously. Um, the other is Hearing protection. Um, hearing protection can come in a couple of different ways. You know, I mean, you can have your traditional muffs. You can have your throwaway style that you just hang around your your head like this. There's a reason I don't like these, and I'll get into that in a minute. Um, or you can do just the standard disposable styles, you know. Um, but you know, like I said, it's, and I'm not going to get into the decibels and I should know that, but I don't know that, um, over a certain, uh, decibel is where you can start to get hearing damage. Um, and you know, a person like me, I haven't worn safety or ear protection as much as I should have. And I have constant ringing in my ears and all that because these power tools, uh, can be extremely loud. And it's, uh, it's one of those things that just builds up over time. Um, so having some form of, of, of hearing protection is good. Um, some people like uh, there's certain types of hearing protection that actually have a hole in it, as strange as that sounds. So you can hear conversations pretty easily. But as far as loud, in, or loud noises, it's going to block those out or muffle them down a little bit. So I said, lots of different versions out there of hearing protection. And uh, if you, especially if you're in a confined space, something along that line, and you're operating a tool, uh, it can build. So like I said, have some hearing protection. What's my issue with these? Well, my issue with these is that you have a string, and this is going to lead into uh, the other, I guess, aspects. Um, when you're working with rotational tools and I say anything that rotates so whether it's a drill you got, you know, rotating whether it's a circular saw where the blade is rotating corded not corded battery operated doesn't really matter if something on that tool is spinning you have to really keep in mind as to what is what you're wearing 
uh, jewelry, you know, ear things like this. It could easily get twisted around, get caught. Anything dangling. It's part of the reason I don't like this style for that reason. Um, so like I said, you, you know, if you're operating any, any rotational tool, you want to make sure that, you know, if you have long hair, tie it back. If you have, you know, cuffs or whatever, uh, I've seen people where they're working with tools and they have, you know, shirts that are bagging down, sweatshirt, ties are another one that's really makes me nervous. Um, jewelry, that can be, uh, that can be one of those issues where, you know, so you, you know, a piece of jewelry gets caught in whatever it is and uh, it can be quick. And so it's something you always want to kind of keep in mind. Um, generally, you know, when I'm working, I try to wear just a simple little t-shirt with no real extras on it, no strings, anything along that line. Uh, you know, if it's winter time, it's cold. Uh, I'm going to keep, keep that in mind also. So, you know, anything I'm wearing is not necessarily bulky, uh, where it's going to be potentially catching on that. Leads me into the next thing. So gloves. Gloves are great, you know, and gloves are one of those things that, you know, when you're working with uh, material, you don't want splinters and whatnot. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But if you, let's say you're wearing a, you know, standard pair of jersey gloves, and let's say you have small hands like me, and, you know, they don't fit snug, and you have all this flop on the end, right? I have seen it where, uh, you know, I have, uh, there was a guy I was working with, and he always wore these gloves, and he was drilling. He was doing this, and he put the drill in reverse. It was a corded drill. He put that drill in reverse and had to steady the chuck. Problem was, the tip caught down here, and what it did was it pulled, it pulled his thumb back far enough and it ended up tearing his almost his thumb completely off. We had to, you know, bind it up, duct tape it, take him down to the hospital, that sort of thing. It was just because of the jersey glove. Uh, you know, he'd been doing it, you know, he'd been working in the field for 30 years. So he said that stuff happens. And you know, it's uh it's one of those things that you just always have to have that in mind. So you know, like I said, even with gloves or even that something that's supposed to protect you can have that uh, that ability uh, to be able to hurt you. So like I said, with gloves, you know, what you want is something that's going to be good, fitting, uh, fits you well, um, is snug enough to where, again, you don't have those spots, those areas that are going to potentially catch on something. And then even with that, you know, like I work with volunteers, you know, I'll tell them, you know, fine, you're wearing gloves or whatever, but if they jump on to a compound miter saw or something along that line, I'm going to ask them to pull those gloves off. Um, and uh, so it's, it's sometimes that balance. And sometimes you're playing around with uh, uh, applying safety gear or taking safety gear off. So, uh, but, you know, as far as gloves go, I said comfortable, good fitting, uh, different types of gloves or different types of things. You know, some people like a leather style glove when they're handling uh, metal or wood, uh, especially like treated lumber. Uh, you don't want to get those splinters. They really fester up pretty bad. Um, so I like to have a glove that's going to be durable enough to where you know, a, a splinter or a chunk of wood is not going to be able to go through that versus like a knit glove. It's going to fly right through that and get you anyways. Um you know, some people like the gloves with the fingers cut off. It's just there's a lot of different styles of glove out there. And again, a lot of it is personal preference. But you do have to kind of keep in mind as far as what it is you're working with, as far as what style of glove you want. Chemical glove, that's another thing. You know, sometimes there's certain chemicals you're working with, and you want a glove that is uh, resistant to whatever chemical that you're working with. By now, everybody should know what these are, right? So, dust masks. Um, there are basically three styles. I'm going to show these three styles here. Um, 
yeah, I'll put this down here like this. And we'll put this like this. So you have you have your standard single single band dust mask. Uh, they call these nuisance masks most of the time. And you know, this is where you're you're, you're working with uh, you're working with dust, or you're working with something that's a little bit annoying. Um, and you just want to kind of keep the bulk of it out of your nose and from breathing it in. Um, obviously the metal band goes over your nose and you're going to push it down like this. And then you're going to have a nice seal around the edges, uh, with that band going around your back or around the back of your head. So they call these nuisance masks again, you know, you're sweeping something like that, right? They have the next level. And this is what's called an N95 mask, and there's a breather on this, actually. Um, this is you generally, you're going to know these because they have a double band. The material is going to be thicker. Uh, it's going to filter out smaller particles, that sort of thing. This is good for, you know, if you're sanding, if you're, uh, you know, getting into those finer dust particles and whatnot um to be able to stop those out so and he said n95 is one of the uh the brand as far as not the brand the, the branding uh as far as the the number as far as what it's going to stop what it's going to filter out the thing with these is that when they start getting clogged up you have to kind of uh possibly get a new one i've seen it where people you know try to reuse these things over and over and over again and just like a furnace filter it's going to get clogged up and the more clogged up it gets the harder you're going to be breathing to be able to pull that air through this material um i've actually seen where people have passed out because they're wearing a mask that's so clogged up and they may have diminished lung function for whatever reason and, you know, all of a sudden they're just slowly getting lack of oxygen from, you know, not being able to breathe through these things and they keel over and pass out on you. That's not good. So, um, you know, keeping that in mind, too, you know, if you have a bit of a lung issue, that sort of a thing, these can start to get a little tricky with that. These are not good for chemicals, paints, that sort of thing, or organic material. So like spray paint, uh, whatever. This is where you start getting into a mask like this. So this is, this is that form fitting mask. This is a, a box full of cartridges, but this is a form fitting mask. All right. Now, these especially are, uh, generally, Generally, they're going to say that you need a doctor's clearance if you're saying, you know, I'm going to be wearing a respirator. This is what they call a respirator. Um, the the cartridges that go on it are for different, the different colors are for different situations that you're in. Um, so if you're spray painting versus, you know, using some kind of a solvent or something along that line, you change around those cartridges and they deal with different environments. Um, because they are so snug fit and they're not going to let barely anything in that's what they're designed to do and you really you're pulling all of your air through these little cartridges which have filtered uh, filtered system inside and again color code depends on what it is that you're using or what you're using these for um if you have any lung issue uh these can become a real problem uh you know like i said we have volunteers we're not allowed to pass these out. Uh, they say you have to be medically cleared to wear these. It's pushing it on these, these thicker ones. So, you know, that gets a little bit in the gray area. So uh, that is something. Found that, that sell these um, box stores and whatnot. Yeah. But they usually will have some kind of a safety geared uh, uh, store or something along that line uh, where they can really get into that with you. Oh, they're okay. So, you disappeared for a minute. So, like I said, respirators or dust masks, 
of all different types. Uh, it's something that you want to try to be able to have in your arsenal to be able to use when you need them. Um, as far as the as far as the tools themselves so we talked about pretty much mostly we've talked about pretty much as far as um what you're going to need personal protective gear what you're going to need for that and there's always going to be a few other things out there uh but the next thing you want to think about is your cord so i'm going to be talking about corded tools when i talk about corded tools Obviously, I'm talking about the tool that you plug into extension cord, you plug into the wall. All right. Um, the reason I'm bringing these up is there's still a decent one, decent amount of them out there. And we talk about this in other classes. So generally what you're going to want is uh, I like personally to have a 12 gauge cord. Um, the lower the number the heavier the cord is, the more amperage you could take, that sort of thing. So I like 12 gauge. Um, there's like 14 gauge out there that's meant for, you know, like running Christmas lights. There's a lamp cord stuff out there like you see for uh, a plug-in or whatever. It's not meant for running tools, uh, especially some of those larger tools. Will it do it? Yeah. The problem is, is that if you're running a tool, a corded tool on uh, uh, too small of a power cord, what's going to happen is it's going to make your motor stress out and uh, burn up sooner than you want. And he said power tools are not cheap necessarily. So he said using a good cord that is rated for uh, whatever, like I said, 12 gauge is generally gonna be good with that. We talk about this and more in other classes. Um, is gonna cover you just fine. Um, the other thing I like in a, an extension cord, I'm gonna be using that. I try to use the shortest one I can. Uh, you know, 25 foot, 50 foot, something along that line. If it gets much longer than that, unless you really, really need it. I've seen it where, you know, you have a, a small cord, and they have, you know, 25 or I'm sorry, 50 foot of it will wad it up on the floor next to them. And they're cutting something that's 10 feet away. And uh, meanwhile, that cord, depending on how much you're using, it, is actually heating up and breaking down the insulation and uh, just shortening the life of that cord. In a sense, also shortening the life of your motor on your power, on your cord and tools. So uh, generally, if, it, if you're going to be using a power cord, uh, you want to do a quick inspection on it. I'm going to say this one right now fails. And why? Because two prong, three prong, your ground on this is missing. Ground on this is good. So this is what's missing off of this one. Um, what is the ground? Well, basically that's for all easy purposes. If you don't have a ground, you know, if you have ground uh, plugged in and let's say there's a short in that tool, you don't become the ground. It grounds out through a grounding rod or something like that in your electrical system. Um, if you don't have a ground, you can potentially become that ground and it's going to run through you and into the ground. So this is where having a grounded plug is a good thing. Now, yes, there are there are cases where people... They only have two prongs, you know, two prong outlet. They sell adapters for that. Uh, it's not a good idea to be snapping off your ground plug because you can't plug it into the outlet you have. They do sell little adapters. Most people have those two prong outlets understand that, but uh, it makes it go from a three prong to a two prong. So they do exist. Uh, the other thing with extension cords is, you know, a quick, a quick look. And, you know, what you're looking for, that's one thing. The other thing you're looking at is, you know, is there melting? Is there scarring, burning, that sort of thing, uh, where that it shows that that cord may have been overloaded. Um, how's the... Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Good it's dark. dark.
last call, I guess. Um, you know, is there is there scarring that sort of thing? And then how is the how is the cover? How is the sheathing on it? And this is what I'm talking about. So on this corded tool here, this is frayed out. Now this is the outer sheathing, and then if you look inside, there's actual wires inside. I can't find them right now. There's actually wires inside that have a coating on them also. Um, so, you know, with any corded tool or, out or, or uh, extension cord, something along that line, you know, if you see that, that cut in that outer sheathing, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bend it. I'm going to look at it a little bit closely, and I'm looking for that copper wire in there. If I see that, that puts that tool out of commission. Um, we could go on with this, but again, we touch on this a lot more in uh, the electrical class. So your cord is important for the health of your tools. And we're about halfway through this. All right. Now, as far as tools go, now I'll, I'll pick on corded tools. If you look at this end, people are gonna say, that's not right. Why? Well, there's no ground on it, right? And they, you'd be correct. There is no ground on this. But there is, if you look right here, see that box inside of a box? That symbol looks like this. It's going to be a box with another box inside. That means that it's a double insulated tool, meaning that it does not need a ground. So, let's say you're at a garage sale or something along that line, and you, you're looking at a, a corded tool, whatever it is. Um, you know, I'm gonna look at that, I'm gonna say, all right, it may have a factory cord on it, it may have a, for, a cord that's been put on by somebody. I see two prongs, all right, I'm gonna look on that tool, and generally somewhere on there, it's gonna have that symbol. If it has that symbol, it's good that I don't need that ground plug for it. The other is what's called a UL listing, underwriters, laboratories. I think most everything has that. Even some of the really old stuff has that. Uh, it just means that it's been tested, it's approved, be sold, that sort of thing. The double insulated to me is one of those a little bit more important. Because like I said, with tools, sometimes over time, people will change the cords out. And you have tools out there that need a ground. They have a three, a three prong uh tool it's not a double insulated tool and they'll find one of these and stick them on at that point that tool becomes dangerous so that's one of the things to look at um we're gonna go over more specifics as far as uh next week you know when we get into the actual two tools and whatnot two weeks oh a couple weeks yeah next time we have power tools um but like I said, you know, with uh, with all corded tools, generally you're going to have that that at least that double insulated uh, symbol uh, in understanding that part. Um, I am going to be getting into what tools are going to be the most helpful for most partners for for most people. Uh, for most people, you know, just wanting to do projects around their house. So I'm going to talk about cordless tools. So cordless tools are all over the place. They have really, really, really gotten very good with cordless tools as far as battery life and stuff like that. I'm going to say this first. Be very, very wary of buying a, a, a cordless tool uh, even a cordless tool set at a garage sale. The reason is, I don't care really what type it is, is that most of the time you think you're buying the tool, you're really buying the battery. Um, so you may find a set at a, at a garage sale and, you know, man, it's got, it's got a drill driver, it's got a circular saw, it's got a sawzall, it's got, it's got all this stuff. And there's a couple batteries and there's even a charger, right? Um, do those batteries take a charge anymore? Have they contained, have, have they uh, gotten what's called a memory where they only hold well, a half a charge or something? 
does the charger actually work? Do, you know, do the batteries last? You know, do they say fully charged and then you try to run them and you only get 10 minutes out of them? These are some of the things that can happen with the batteries as they get old. Um, so what happens is people buy this stuff and they'll think, oh, you know, I can go out and I can buy another battery. Sometimes yes, usually not. Or if you can, you end up spending a lot of money just for the battery. So that's one of those things that, you know, you have to be a little leery of. Um, two types of batteries out there. The uh, lithium, uh, lithium batteries generally they're a lighter battery. They'll say lithium, 20 volt, whatever. Uh, but they're a lithium battery. Those are the more modern versions, I guess. And then you have the, what are called NICAD batteries. Basically, if you were to open this thing up, it would look like a bunch of C batteries all linked together. With that, with the NICADs, you can a lot of times take them into Batteries Plus or something along that line or a battery store and say, hey, can you repack this? And they'll say, yeah, you know, they'll open it up and they'll say, yeah, we can put new batteries in there and, you know, uh, make it so that they'll take charge again. As long as your charger is working, that might be a way to be able to do that. Um, last I knew, feel free to correct me, uh, but the last I knew, they couldn't repack lithium batteries. Now, things are always changing. It would surprise me if now they can, but last I knew, they could not. So for your NICAD batteries, for your first generation batteries, they can be repacked and, you know, extend that life quite a bit. So that's kind of the general gist as far as any cordless tool. Um, keep that in mind, I guess. So what tools are actually good to have? Well, I'm going to say that probably out of almost any of the cordless tools that you can find out there, and I'm talking for home use, uh, what's called a drill driver is going to be probably the most versatile tool that you're going to be able to find, uh, especially for just a homeowner use. Um, you know, you can, you can drill. I have it on high speed so I can drill something, drill holes, whatever it is that I need to do. I could put it on a lower speed setting where I can drive. I'm driving screws, something along that line. There's different torque settings, and we'll talk about these in a minute, uh, where it's actually going to stop once it reaches a certain amount of resistance. And that's what that is. So it makes it so you don't overdrive a screw or something along that line. So, like I said, a drill driver, and that's why they call it a drill driver. Drilling meaning you're, you're actually drilling holes in something. Driving meaning you're driving a screw, you're driving a bolt, uh, you're driving whatever. Uh, generally, these are going to be the most useful uh, of, of really any of the cordless tools. Um, <clears throat> as far as the brand or type and stuff like that, you know, so let's say you go to the store. And you're looking at all different types, right? There's, you know, Black and Decker. There's Firestorm. There's, you know, this is the Porta Cable. You have your little Black and Decker one. You have all different brands out there. Um, these are all oh, both Black and Decker. Generally, I'm going to say this: um, the the ones that are, uh, you know, like DeWalt, um, Milwaukee, Porta Cables, Hitachis, that sort of thing. Generally, those are for people that this is what they do for a living. Um, you know, you're going to pay a little bit more. And usually what you're paying for is a little bit more power in the battery. And I'm talking about lithium batteries because that's pretty, that's all they sell right now. So you get a little more power in the battery. The battery itself is going to be lighter. The charge time is going to be quicker. And, you know, how, how long it's going to last is going to be a little bit quicker. Uh, or, or, you know, it's, it's going to last a little bit longer. And it's generally a little more durable. Because, again, if, this, if you're doing this for your job, 
you could be up on a ladder doing, you know, whatever, you drop your tool, you don't have to worry about that you broke it because they're designed to deal with that. And, you know, dropped in the dirt or dropped in the mud or whatever. Um, but you're going to pay that price. Um, you know, as far as, you know, do you really need that for home use? Not really. You know, there is nothing wrong with, you know, an 18 volt uh, Craftsman or Black & Decker or something along that line. Ryobi is another one that's great for home use. They do just about everything that all the others do. They just have a little, a little lower price point. And again, you're not going to be using them day after day and trying to drill holes that are this big and doing all sorts of stuff with them. Um, so that's usually the first thing you want to look at. Second thing is I, I call them bells and whistles. What are the bells and whistles on these? Well, one of them is how does it feel? You know, is it big? Is it bulky? Is it heavy? You're always going to have... Uh, you know, it's something you can pick up and grab and even try, you know, try running a screw in and stuff. How does it feel on your hand? That's the first thing. A lot of people pick it up and say, oh, it feels great. You know, do this, you know, or do this and see how it feels after holding it up there for a minute or so. Because you're going to find yourself in those positions where you're underneath something and you're trying to hold it like this. And uh, it has to be comfortable in your hand. So... That's one thing. The other thing is, is that some of them have lights. You know, this one's got a little light right here. And, you know, is that useful? Only when you're in a dark area. It's super useful. You know, how many times I found myself inside a cabinet underneath trying to, you know, screw something up. And it's dark and I'm trying to hold a flashlight in my mouth. But you get one that has a little flashlight on it. Great. Right? So, you know, little details like that. I've seen ones where they have a level built into it, a little level bubble. So let's say you're drilling a hole through a door. We were talking about this in door class. You want to make sure you're level. Well, some of them have it built right in. So you can, yep, I'm level right there. I can drill my hole. Um, some have magnets where I can put my screws and stuff and they're stuck right there and work. I can hold it however I want to hold it. Like I said, lots of different things. This one has a little spot to be able to hold your bits. So, you know, like I said, they all kind of have their gimmicks or whatever. And I say they're not necessarily gimmicks. They actually are very helpful. But, uh, you know, it kind of depends on what it is that you're, what it is that you're looking for. So, do you need the 20 volt, the 24 volt, that sort of thing? Well, what I can say about that is, is that if you're buying just, let's say you're buying just a drill driver, um, that could be a good thing. Uh, you may not necessarily need that. More often than not, you're going to find that companies are making sets where, you know, this battery is going to not only work in your drill driver, it's going to work for your circular saw, it's going to work for your sawzall. It's going to work for a chop saw. Actually, a cordless chop saws now. It's going to work for your lawnmower. So, yeah, sometimes, you know, if you're like, man, I really like this. And I, I really like this brand. You know, you may want to stick with that because you can interchange those batteries out. And usually, you're going to get a couple batteries when you buy whatever it is all that you're doing. So, I guess that's the other thing to keep in mind is that, you know, if you really like that cordless freedom, um, it might be one of those things where you, uh, you know, you want to think about if you're, if you're going to have future, uh, future, um, cordless tools and not having a whole bunch of different brands and trying to figure out what battery goes with what charger and all sorts of things. So, so drill driver, uh, I would say that is probably going to be one of your, uh, biggest uh as far as handiest tool out there um so we will be talking about this the relative of a drill driver is what's called an impact driver and all an impact is 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 literally made for driving driving screws driving whatever you don't drill holes out with an impact driver 
But the nice thing about an impact driver is, is I can put my bit in there and I can drill a screw that's that long and I can sit there and go and just drill it right in, no problem. And then I can turn around and there's enough control in it with pulsing it where I can put on a real delicate screw for a hinge or something along that line. Um, so it, it has that versatility. Home use, eh, most of the time homeowners aren't gonna use this. Out in the field, we use this all the time. But th that is the difference. You're gonna see generally uh, drill driver or impact driver. Similar, but they have different uses. I'd say the drill driver is still probably your bigger bet. It's another version, just a you know smaller version of the drill driver. So the other tool I would say that that is uh, real handy, corded or cordless, um, is going to be your circular saw. Um, circular saws are one of those that you know you can make your cuts, cross cuts, that sort of thing. Um, they can do angles. They can do depth cuts. Um, you know, this one I can set it to where, let's say I want to cut out a floor, but I only want to cut out, uh, you know, like however many inches into the floor so I can bevel it like this, take my measurement to the tip of the blade and lock it, <coughs> and then be able to do lunge cut into my flooring say and i don't want to cut through all my flooring i want to just cut through a certain layer and make my cuts um circular saws are one of those that the more you use them the more you find out how useful they really are um are they that accurate eh, not as accurate as a, a compound miter saw uh, or what some people call a chop saw but yeah, they're they're pretty handy. And again, you know, you're getting into what it is that you're, what it is you're trying to repair, what it is you're trying to do. Uh, but circular saws uh, are very good with um, a lot of different areas. Now you're gonna hear people say, a, you're gonna hear a lot of people say. Um, you're going to hear a lot of people say something along the line of, you know, what size, um, uh, you know, they'll say like a seven and a quarter inch circular saw or a four inch circular saw or something along that line. And what they're talking about with that is they're talking about the blade size. So blade size, uh, you know, on uh, uh, our guy here, that's in you know, our corded version, this blade right here. Is a seven and a quarter inch blade versus this one. This is a five and a half inch blade. So that's all they're talking about. If they say four inch or five inch, five and a half, seven and a quarter, they're talking about blade size. There are circular saws out there that have a 12 inch blade. They're scary to use. Um, so yeah, that boils down to what it is you're cutting and stuff like that. The most common, uh, as far as corded, is seven and a quarter. Uh, you know, uh, for cordless, eh, anywhere from five and a half to four-ish or so, uh, you're going to find them all over the place. Now, what does that mean? Well, what that means basically is, is if this is on full depth, meaning it's on as much as it can possibly cut. You know, this is showing you right here. You can cut from the table right here to the tip of the saw. In this case, I don't have my tape measure, but this case, it looks like maybe two inches depth. So you'd be able to cut something that's roughly two inches thick versus this guy, where when it's fully, oh, I can cut quite a bit more. That's what that that depth that that blade size does. It, it just gives you a deeper a deeper cut. Now, are you really going to be getting into really cutting that stuff that's that deep or that thick? Probably not. But that's what. It is. So, um, the other is, and I'll just bring it over. The other is 
compound miter saw. Now, this is one of these tools that, you know, if you're making a lot of cuts, um, you're doing a lot of uh, repetitive cuts, let's say you're building a, a fence or you're building a deck or a side porch or something along that line, um, this can really be handy. Um, it's got, um, well, this one does not want to let go with this. It's got different size blades. So in this case, this is a 10 inch blade. They have chop saws or compound miter saws that have uh, upwards of a 12 inch blade. And again, how much can you cut through? Um, these tools are nice. Unless you're getting into some pretty specific projects or you're actually getting into, uh, you know, more of a handy person sort of thing where you're always using something this, like this, is it worth buying? That's a hard, that's a hard thing to say. You know, I, I've seen where people go out and they'll buy one of these things and they're, you know, easily four to $500 and they'll use it once and it sits. Some people are fine with that. You know, I mean, as long as it's sitting somewhere safe, it's fine. But, you know, do you really want to buy it for a single project? Maybe not. You can rent these. Uh, sometimes that's usually where people will end up going with that. And they may rent it a couple times and then realize, oh, my gosh, this thing can do quite a bit. Uh, you know, this can make it so I can actually be able to build that fence quicker or my deck quicker or whatever it is, trim out my house or whatever. So... Um, you know, and that's the thing with power tools as far as, uh, you know, any power tool, really. Um, you know, if there's an issue out there as far as, uh, you know, making something either a quicker or easier or, you know, just more efficient. Somebody has made a power tool for that. Um, power tools are all over the place. I mean, as far as, you know, the, the, the things that they can do. Um, like you said, this class kind of, kind of, uh, sticks around with the, uh, the, the most common, I guess is probably the best way to say it. You know, the most common power tools you're going to see out there or the ones that most partners are going to be, or most people that are, uh, living in their home are going to actually use. So compound miter saw, I said, we'll get into this, uh, next time. Uh, why do they call it a, a compound miter? Well, the miter is this part where I can, I'm not used to working with this thing backwards. I can set it at different degrees, 45 degrees to make trim for around doors or whatever, um, down to zero or 90 degree cuts for cross cuts, that sort of thing. I can also, this is the compound side of it. And sure enough, yeah, I can tilt it like this to be able to make cuts that way. And this is, you start getting into a little advanced, but this, you know, when they say compound miter, the miter is your 45, your 30s, your, you know, your 15 degrees. And then, you know, the miter or the compounds are when that blade tips sideways. So as a general rule, most people don't even get into that compound side of things. Um, but that is what the compound miter saw is. As far as, like I said, I'm not getting into how to use those. That's next time we're going to be getting into that. You know, this one right now, if you were to look at this, again, two prong. So we were talking about that. That's the double insulated. So somewhere on this, there should be something saying having that double insulated symbol. And sometimes finding it is difficult. But like I said, they're supposed to have it on there somewhere. Um, but uh, yeah, compound miter saws are one of those tools that are very nice uh, to be able to have. Sawzalls or reciprocating saws, some people will call them. 
Um, basically, what this is is a, a tool that I can put different blades in. This is a fine tooth blade for cutting metal and stuff like that. It gets inserted right in there. I have a little hole in that. It gets inserted in, and that blade grabs. So, nah, I don't want to say twice anymore. But, you know, when you run that, you can run at a variable speed, and we'll talk about that in a second. Yeah, this is designed for, you know, this is cutting metal. So let's say I wanted to cut, I don't know, this metal pipe right here. Oh, wouldn't you, but that's what I would use this for. I'd put this up against here and be able to cut through that. Um, sometimes the blades are flexible enough to where, sorry, I'm moving around. Let's say I have a wall that's standing up and I need to cut the nails. I could buy blades that are a little extra long and I can actually bend that blade and cut underneath that wall and be able to cut those nails going into the subfloor. I could change the blade out and uh, put a wood blade on it and cut, cut wood or do whatever I need to do with that. I can put a pruning blade on it and I can, you know, if I'm digging a hole for a tree and there's a big old tree root, well, grab a pruning blade and you just stick it in there and <laughs> cut whatever you need. Uh, a sawzall is one of those, uh, one of those funny tools that, um, the more you use it, the more you go, oh my gosh, this thing really can do quite a bit. So he said sawzall or reciprocating saw is actually a very nice tool to be able to have, um, uh, you know, potentially in your arsenal. Because again, it's one of those that has multiple uses. And some people can get really creative in how they use these tools. Um, you're going to see a few terms, I guess, thrown around. We have about five minutes left, so I'm going to th throw a few of those out. Um, you're going to have what's called a variable speed trigger. And all that means basically is I'm barely squeezing that trigger right now, and it's barely moving. And the more I squeeze it, the faster that tool is going to go. So variable speed trigger, that's what they're talking about. You know, drill drivers have that on there also. And I'm saying this because I might be bringing this up in the next uh, the next power tool class that we have. So this has variable speed trigger, meaning the more I pull it, the harder I pull it, the faster it's gonna go. All right. So variable speed trigger, that is a nice feature. I would say just about all of them have that. But if you read that, that's what you that's what it is they're talking about. The other is what's called an electronic break or breaking action, sometimes they call it. Um, and this can be corded tools, cordless tools, doesn't really matter. A lot of these are interchangeable. But what that means is when I take my hand off the trigger, or I take my hand off the trigger, say I like on a chop saw or something like this, um, you're actually going to either, either it's A, just going to stop real quick, and, or it's going to slow way down. And, and it, you almost hear this, this uh, almost sounds like brakes being applied to that blade to be able to slow that down. Why is that important? Well, let's go back to the story of my friend in that Jersey glove. He was using a very old drill and it did not have that break in it. And he had realized that yes, he had caught his, his floppy glove in that chuck that was moving. You know, it was actually in reverse, you know. He caught that and he realized that happened and he took his hand off that trigger. But the issue was, is that it was an old drill and it just, even with your hand off the trigger, it didn't have any braking action or anything like that. So it just continued to rotate just from the momentum of what it was doing before. Whereas if he was using a tool that had some kind of electric brake, as soon as he took his hand off that trigger, it wouldn't have dragged his thumb back all the way and sent him to the hospital. So uh, that electronic braking or braking feature uh, is actually a safety issue. Um, so, and, you know, sometimes using some of those older tools, whether they're corded or cordless, 
Um, you know, you may run into those where you don't have some of those safety features built in. Um, the other is, and I'm gonna I'm gonna leave you hanging with this one here. Power tools talk to you. All you have to do is learn how to understand what they're saying. Every tool is going to tell you when it's happy, when it's not happy. Uh, they're going to be able to tell you things like, I'm not working right, or you're not doing something right. You're tearing them something up. You know, and it's one of those things that after you work with them for a while, you can be halfway across the room and listening to somebody operate a chop saw or operate a drill driver or something like that. And be able to say, oh, they're stripping a screw. Oh, they're chopping through that wood too fast. Well, they're burning that wood or whatever. Um, and it's just in how that tool is sounding, what it's doing, how it's acting, how it's acting in your hands, you know, what it's, what it's telling you. And that's what we're going to be really touching and in getting into uh, the next class as far as how to talk tool. So... Stay tuned for that. Is there any questions? I know we talked about mostly safety, but that's a big part of it. With that, I think we're done. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, we haven't. We didn't have any questions yet, Lee. Okay. Um, but if people do have questions, you can email them to the <clears throat> to the email address at the bottom of the screen, um, or you can comment on here, and we will see the comments. Um, after they come in. So we will try to get back to you on those answers as well. Yeah. I appreciate everyone who joined us this evening. Um, I hope you come back in two weeks to see the second half of Power Tools and also join us for the window screen repair next week. Thank you very much, Lee, for, for teaching tonight. Very informational, lots of good, good stuff there. So I really appreciate you uh, taking time out tonight to be here. No Thank problem. you once again, everyone, for joining us. And we'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. Um, okay.